this is Pendulum. Thank you for watching. Today I'm very excited. We're going to be going over, in this video, ink swatching. And this is a very big topic. Um, there's a lot to cover. So what I'm thinking is we're going to have a series of videos with subtopics on this subject, since there is a lot to cover. In this particular video, we're going to be covering ink swatching and creative ways to do it. So you can see here, um, these are only a few of the methods that we're going to be cover covering today in this video. But basically, let's talk about why we ink swatch and different traditional and creative methods to get it done. So why do we ink swatch? I think a great reason to ink swatch is right when you get a brand new ink, whether it's a sample vial or a bottle, is to understand the true color and tone of the ink that you've just acquired and the properties and tonalities of it. So what you see in digital representation or what you see on the packaging may not be the reality of what the color is. So here before us is an example. This is Dimine Nutcracker. And here I have a Q-tip um, ink swatch of the color. And this is familiar and well known to most of us. And basically you would just use a Q-tip swab to go ahead and make your ink sample. So this would be one application and then a more saturated second, starting with saturated Q-tip, going to lighter, and then some dots as well. And then using a dip pen to do a fine and a more broad writing sample so that you can anticipate what this color is going to look like when you're writing. So that's all very good, but you're missing out on some properties. You could get more saturation from a Q-tip, but you would have to do it quite intentionally. So then if we want to get more creative too and a little bit more um, properties shown, in a fun way, you can do uh, brush work. So this was done with a watercolor brush, adding some water to kind of show more of the color values and with higher saturation, as you can see, now we're picking up on some properties that we didn't get to see at all in this previous sample. We're seeing that there's a green sheen with the high saturation. And then there's some ink splatters. Now, these are just a few examples but I have quite a few creative ideas about how you can be doing ink sampling. And I think it makes it a lot more fun and it reveals more of the interesting properties of the inks that you may not be able to view otherwise. So some of the things to keep in mind also is when you're selecting your particular pen. So once you've taken a look at what this particular ink is capable of and its true coloring, you can then pair it with a pen that would do well for it. For example, the green sheen that we've unearthed is in this particular ink, the Dye My Nutcracker. If I use a drier pen or a finer pen, this is probably what I'm gonna be seeing. It's just brown. So now that I know that this ink has a sheen property, I can pair it with a broader um, fountain pen. So the wetter the ink, obviously, the more saturated, the more you're going to pick up on these special properties, whether that sheening, shading, shimmer, whatever it may be. So now that I know that this property exists with this ink, I can pair it with a wetter fountain pen, whether that's a broad or even a fine that just has a very wet and generous ink flow. So those are some reasons that you would want to even do ink swatching to begin with. That's not even touching that you might want to catalog your inks for future reference and for fun. So whether, again, it's a sample vial or a full bottle, you can always document that. But it's great for reference for future use. And... I think that that's definitely worth doing and there's a lot of ways to organize and catalog the inks that you've tried or own. We'll be covering that particular subject in a different 
video. Today we're just talking about creative techniques for ink swatching. So let's jump right into that. So I'm going to show some samples and ideas that I've done and then we're actually going to use a particular ink and do all of these techniques together. But I want to show some of the ideas. So this is done with Q-tip like the one I've already shown. So this is standard but I think this is cool too. Start out with high saturation and work lighter. High saturation, lighter. So even using a Q-tip, there's a lot of creative things that you can do to show off more colors. This is with a watercolor brush. So standard, you could even do circles, and then introducing some water to show some of the undertones of the ink. This was done with a folded um, dip nib. So straight lines and that can show the values also. This was also with a folded nib, just a different shape or design. Same here. This was with a watercolor brush having water introduced again to show the different um, tonalities of the ink. Same thing there. Same idea but instead of doing a back and forth kind of square rectangular shape it's a circle. That's um, also with a brush. This is with a sponge, like an art sponge, and I think that's a very kind of fun and unique thing to do. This is using the back of your dip pen. So you kind of just start an area of saturation and move out, and I think that's really a lot of fun. Same thing there. And then ink splatters, which I think are tremendously fun. And they can get a little messy, but um, we've got some tips for that too. And just look at the properties that you pick up on when you get that high saturation from ink splatters. I, I think that's tremendously fun. This is another uh, paintbrush with water in the center. So I think that's super just artistically fun. And that's the same ink again with the splatter. Just love it. So those are some examples about what we're going to be doing today, but there's even more um, techniques that we'll be doing than that. So the ink that we'll be using for the demonstrations today is this. This is the ink sample I have for already. I actually have this in a ink uh, sample vial. So it's the J. Herbon Amethyst de l'Oreal, I think, <laughs> something like that. And so here's a quick note on when you're doing ink swatching, obviously um, either you're doing it from a full-sized bottle or you're doing it from a sample vial. And for me often it's sample vials because I have way more sample vials than I do of actual bottles of ink. So when you're doing these, I would suggest that you have something to stabilize your ink. It can be a accessory, like I have this wooden um, desk accessory to hold my vial of ink so that when I put it in here and I unscrew it, the likelihood of me tipping it over is very unlikely or spilling it. Or I can decant it into this vial. So that's what I'll be doing because I'm going to be using some broader um, tools to do my ink swatches with, like the folded nib, it's quite wide, and that would be difficult to do in this small vial. But just something to consider as you do this. So let's dive into these different techniques, these um, various options that you have for having fun with your ink swatching. First of all, a good reminder, especially if you're going to be ink swatching a ink that has special properties, whether it's a bottle or a sample, make sure that you give it a good shake before you pour it out so that you have all those, the glitters or um, whatever properties might be mixed in nicely incorporated together so that they show up well in your ink sampling. So I just decanted it into, this is a Miser inkwell and I have it in clear. So let's start out with the good old trusty Q-tip method. So get it well saturated into the ink and then 
we're gonna ink swab. So go through all the way once, I would recommend. Dip again, and then do a higher saturation area like that. Um, you could also do kind of a squiggly line. So saturation to low, and we can also do dots. I think the important thing when you're ink swatching is that you're going to get the best benefit from being able to see high saturation to low saturation properties because this is going to represent wet fountain pens and dry ones. So you don't have to do this many dots, but the idea is that this is high saturation, this is low. So we want to be able to see the value and properties that this ink has to offer. So that is, I think, some of the best options when using a Q-tip for your application. Next, let's use a paintbrush. This is a watercolor paintbrush. It's a number four. And I would recommend nothing smaller than a four. I think larger would be fine, like a six or an eight, but I wouldn't recommend smaller personally. So it's important when you're using your brush, in my opinion, to wet it first with water, just plain water, get it well saturated, and then dry it off. And then you're ready to go ahead and dip it into the ink. So again, well saturated, just dab it off a little bit. Let's do um, a square and a circle. So this is more of a rectangular shape, saturation to none or low, and then circular also. And you could you could certainly do dots with a paintbrush too. It's not going to be as perfectly round, but you can you can do it. You can get a little bit more creative and maybe do flowers or leaves. See, so the areas that the ink pools are going to end up being the high saturation areas and then drier. You just want to be able to get those tones, in my opinion, with these ink colors. Um, another thing would be, you can do this with the round or the square, but using some water, so just clean water. I have a little bit of purple in the brush already, that's why it's showing up kind of a pink color. and then reload it up. So that's gonna end up showing some of the values there. So we'll do something similar with the round. So work your way around the water first, because once you hit it, there you go. Something like that. Good. So uh, that's with the watercolor brush. Next is the ink splatter, and this can be a messy endeavor. So my recommendation to keep things neat and tidy, get a piece of paper, fold it in either a threes or fours, and we're going to make it into a kind of circular shape like this. 
and we'll use a piece of tape to keep it closed just like that you can use anything um it can be the bottom of a, a paper cup um get creative something to keep contain the mess basically is what you're going to want to do so place it there and there's a little bit of um air gap I think at the bottom of this the less the better so if you're more exact in the way that you place this it'll turn out better the key to getting a good ink splat in my experience is the amount that you're splattering and the height that you splatter from and you actually want it quite high and quite generous so let's use a eyedropper let's get some ink and I'm going to raise this probably like a, like 12 inches, like a foot from the paper. Okay, so as you can see, let me move this over. There's plenty of splatter that happens on that ring of paper. And I kind of tested this and saw how far up it splatters. And that's why I said use, you know, um, three or four folds, depending, uh, or two or three folds, excuse me. And that will contain it pretty much. Otherwise it makes kind of a gigantic mess all over your, your desk or table or wherever you're, you're doing your ink splats. So this is more than you would do like on a, if you were going to do it on a um, ink swatch paper, maybe you just want to do one or two. So I'll do that too, just so we have a more realistic representation. So now we have our ink splatters and they're very nice and clean. Next up, let's try a folded uh, metal nib. This is from Browse, and they come in, you know, calligraphy dip sets, or you can purchase them individually. But also, there's some made by individual creators as well. So I'll um, see if I can put some in the links. But basically, it's just folded over, and there's an area to hold the ink. And we'll just dip this into the ink. And you can do straight individual lines, or you can take that and make a box. I have not had success going in a circular movement for this, so I wouldn't personally recommend it. But you can pull this down a little bit too, like this, so that you get a little bit more ink variation. Um, I really like doing this kind of shape with this folded nib. I think that brings some interest. Something like that I think is really fun. I've had success going with straight lines with this in the past too. Let's... There we go. So I kind of have to start a little bit vertically and then I can pull. So you can do that as well. And I think that's a really good option. So that's with the folded nib. All right, some of us might also have <clears throat> a glass pen and we're gonna use the back of this. It's round and smooth relatively. So we're gonna use the back of this to do some ink swatching. Just dip it in and get it nice and saturated. And then you'll be able to do this. Or you can kind of wet an area like that. And then come in with this and make some interesting lines and patterns. Again, I think the best approach is to be able to get high and low saturation. So 
through here we'll get the high saturation and through some of these veins and swirls we'll get the low. You can also kind of do some dots I think. And again this will give you some varying values starting from the saturated to the not so saturated. So I think this one's really, let me try it with one dot. You just kind of go crazy with this one. You don't, <laughs> there's no rhyme or reason. So I would say one dot turns out better than this kind of got a little, a little bit out of hand. <laughs> um, also with this um, glass tip pen, you can use the vertical sides to do some ink swatching. So you can make some lines quite easily. Let's see if we can do some squiggles or not. Yeah, that works. So I think that's actually very helpful to be able to do that. So I'd say those are some great recommendations for your glass dip pen. It doesn't really work so well on like particular paint brushes or um, the holders for dip pens unless it has a more rounded smooth end on it. This is too pointy and you won't be able to get the same effect. Also um, a great dip pen that would work really well is those um, Kakamori dip brass or um, steel. Those work really tremendously well for same thing being able to move it vertically and lay down some ink. So these are some um, creative, but, you know, kind of traditional too, ways of doing ink swatching. So I'm going to move over to a new sheet. We're going to let those dry and I'll show you all the results once they're dry too, because that's what really matters. Like it's really fun to work with wet ink, but you don't see the properties until they're dry more properly. Um, so let's see. I really liked, what really got me thinking a little bit more out of the box is Leanne Likes. She does a circle with a, condi a steel condiment jar or a metal one anyway. And she puts down some ink. So she'll do a dot or two, I think. And I don't have um, a condiment jar, but what I did have was this. This is a cosmetic tin. So like it opens up and you can store things inside of it. So what you're really looking for is a flat kind of smooth surface. So you put your ink drops down, put this on top. You're going to swirl it back and forth to make sure that the ink moves everywhere and lift it. And then you get the high and low saturation areas to show the properties of the ink. Loved this idea from Leanne. And this is what really got me thinking. She just used some item from her from her home. What else can we use? <laughs> so I liked the um, the condiment use quite a lot, but again, I just started thinking. So I had an even smaller one, and that fit better. You'd only want to use one drop, right? That makes sense. If you use too much ink, you won't get high and low areas of saturation. You'll just get high. It'll be just completely saturated. So that, that worked better for the size of the paper that I was using for ink swatching, but it's the same idea. And then um, I was thinking, I have this, this is like one of those soothing or fidgety rocks that have been kind of ground and polished for, they call them like thumb rocks. So I had this and I thought, I bet this would work really well also. Let me give it a shot. So I went ahead with my eyedropper. I have to use even less ink for this. Just one drop with this different eyedropper. Um, I got this eyedropper with my Dominant Industries ink. It came with it. And then I put this over. I like that it's clear because I can see what's happening. You can see that shadow. 
And then I move it around as big as I want my circle to be and lift it. And I'm going to get a less perfect but very appropriate circle with high saturation and low. So this has been one of my favorite ways and that's actually how I do my ink swatches now along with a paintbrush on the perimeter. But that's how I do this circular portion because I like that you can see the low saturation and the high saturation and I love using the stone. It's so much fun and it's such a pleasure to use something from nature and it's just a lovely experience. So if you have, start thinking of things that you have creatively to use at home. Something circular and that has a, a round smooth surface, slightly round. Um, if, like you could even use ink caps. So like that would work fine. This would work fine. It's round and smooth and flat. These would not because of the embossed imprint. Like it would just get inconsistent. I would say this is too flat. There's not enough of a belly. It might work, but it wouldn't work as well. These have indentations. So that I don't think would work. Same with this. It has a embossed logo. So that wouldn't work too well, but smooth and a little bit rounded surface even this ink lid like these would all work really well for um executing that idea so start thinking outside of the box box as far as what kind of things you have that you can use so i continued this thought process and i have this glass stirrer so again i was like okay let's let's see what this thing got so i can dip this in here and this works really nicely to do kind of some squiggles. There's not as much control for, um, you know, how ink is released. So very saturated to none kind of quickly, but I like it. It really is quick and easy to use. And to me, one of the most important things when I'm ink swatching is I want it easy to clean. And because this is glass, you just swish it in some water and pat it dry and you're on to the next ink sample. So I think that works really quite nicely. Then I have this sponge. This is a natural um, sponge. It's used in art a lot. And I would say the important thing, like your brush, is get this, this is very porous. So get this well saturated with water Get it wet with water first and dry it nicely before you use it with ink. Otherwise, it's going to get stained and kind of ruined. So I'm just going to put it in the water until it's nice and absorbed. And then press it dry. So I don't want it, like, don't go crazy. Just squeeze the water out. So this is what it looks like now. And then I'm going to take my eyedropper again and put um, a generous little pool there for this to work on and saturate one area and then just kind of work around with it. And you can obviously do whatever, whatever kind of shapes or patterns. Um, you can even use it like this, honestly, and make like a nice big circle if that's what you wanted to do. But the best way to get the high and low areas of saturation is by dabbing it. So I I think it's really fun. I could easily go crazy with that. <laughs> um, when you're done with that sponge, just make sure that you immerse it in water promptly so that it doesn't stain and you can wash it easily and quickly for the next ink that you have to follow. So um, yeah, other things too, like if you have any of these clips you can use again it has to be something round and flat or like I have this stone turtle I bet his little um his shell would work really nicely for ink swatching just like that um so I think those are all tremendous ideas so yeah I mean get creative think outside the box what do you have lying around that you can use for ink swatching and have fun with it 
and get some really cool effects when everything's said and done. Uh, again, the most important thing to me is high saturation and low saturation areas, something uh, that you can easily control, and something that's quick to wash. So I think that all these items definitely qualify. Some are certainly easier to wash than others and faster, but they all would work tremendously well. So then when it comes to actually labeling your swatch, um, some people would be using, you know, their glass, their glass dip pen, or maybe if you're already inked up a fountain pen, you can certainly use that. But more often not, than not, when I'm doing my ink swatching, it's before I choose to ink up a pen with this. This is more like the first thing I do so I can see the color matches and so I can see the properties because that's the best way, in my opinion, to pair it with a pen so that you know what you can accomplish with this ink. So I often use fine and extra fine flex and stub nibs. So I actually use dip nib for my running samples on my swatches. So this is the benefit. If I get, this is a blue pumpkin by Browse and I'll zoom in and dip it. But if I use this, I usually will write the maker of the ink. And optionally, you can add any, any details you want to. So if you do a lot of flex writing, then, you know, do a little, do a little flex on this so that you have a sample of what this ink can do. Um, sorry, my ink flow was not doing well there. That's better. And also I do, as I mentioned, use quite a bit of stubs and italics. So this is also a browse dip nib and it's an italic. It's a 0 0.7. So then I'll usually do the name of the ink here. Let me make sure I spell this correctly. So then when I have my ink swatch, I can see the tonalities and I can see if I use a fine nib, what it's going to look like. If I use a stub, what it's going to look like. And again, even in this, there's going to be some inconsistencies because when you're using dip, it's going to probably be fairly generous with the ink and you may not have a pen that's that generous, or you may have a pen that's even more wet or more generous. So they're kind of guides. It's not going to be exact, but you know, you could choose to use your fountain pen once you've inked these up also. That's just what has worked for me. That's what I've done. So I'm going to let these ink samples dry so that I can show you what they look like. I'm going to say also in a different video, I'm going to cover papers and organization methods, but when doing ink swatching, this is what I've had the most success in, is using heavier paper. So when I've done ink swatching on books, and you know, there's various notebooks you could use, obviously, but if the weight of the paper is too light, it's gonna, it's gonna take some wear on the paper because we're at least for myself I'm looking for high saturation 
swatching. So they get kind of crinkly and they don't stand up to the saturation of the ink as well. So this is, I don't really know how to pronounce this, but um, I'm not going to try. <laughs> it's going to be scary. Um, 70 sheets, it's 80 gram. And the Rhodia is 80 gram or 21 pound, it says. So I've used very often watercoloring paper. So this is 140 pound, 300 gram. And the paper that I was using while we've been doing this whole experience is um, this Bristol Smooth paper. And this is 100 pound, 270 gram. So this is, you know, this doesn't crinkle or anything, even though I, it, the paper did warp a bit, I will say, but not very much compared to what it would when you're dropping that much ink on it. So those are things to consider too, is what kind of paper you're going to use. And as I mentioned, we'll cover that in a future video. Okay, everything has dried with the exception of this um, multi <laughs> ink splatter area. That is still kind of dry. You can see the, the wetness there. But let's take a closer look at all these so you can see how they turned out. So this was the Q-tips. And this was the paint brushes watercolor brushes, then our ink splatters, and over here this was the folded nib, and these were the back and sides of the glass tip pen, and these were the circular ones with both the cosmetic tins and the thunstone and this was a glass stir stick and the dots as well and then this was an art sponge and then this was the writing with the dip nibs also so those are some ideas I think there'll be even more in the future so I I'd love to hear what you guys use for your ink swatching and both for the writing portion and for the actual swatch part what's your favorite instrument to use right now in your ink swatching and did any of these techniques interest you or excite you and you're gonna look at trying them out for yourself let me know in the comments below and thank you so much for watching i will see you on the next one